The life of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, also known as Shakyamuni, is relatively well known. Born as a prince and sheltered from the world, upon experiencing suffering, he renounced his former princely life and dedicated himself to meditation and cultivation of the wisdom that would be foundational to the religion we know as Buddhism. Those familiar with the story of the prince may be surprised to learn that they only know the story of one of his lives. Reincarnation is a central tenet of Buddhism, and tradition tells of many episodes from the Buddha's past lives. Known as Jataka, or birth tales, these glimpses into past lives are among the oldest stories told in the Buddhist tradition evidenced by their appearance in many of the most ancient Buddhist artworks. Jataka tales spread throughout the ancient world, with parallel themes appearing in stories as far off as Aesop's fables in Greece and even Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in medieval England. The stories vary widely. Most often, the future Buddha incarnates as a human, while in other births, he is a nature spirit, or an animal. The situations vary widely, but in every case, the Buddha relates the past life to the present, providing guidance for the future. By taking a closer look at Jataka tales, we can better understand not only the early Buddhist community, but also cultivate wisdom in our own lives and compassion for others. My name is Sean. Welcome to Mythos and Logos. There are many realms in Buddhist cosmology, and over the course of many lives one can travel across them. The realms of gods, demigods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, and hells. And as such, not all of the Buddha's past lives told in Jataka tales are human. About a third of the incarnations are in the animal or heavenly realms. One quality shared by every Jataka story is the relation to the current life. Every tale begins with an audience, typically monks, and ends with the Buddha identifying who he, and even his followers, were in a past life. And every tale has a moral. In one example, the Buddha is born as the king of a flock of quails. A clever hunter threatens the flock with his method of mimicking the bird's call and trapping them in a net to be captured, sold, and eaten. The future Buddha holds a meeting of the flock, telling them how if they each coordinate their flight together, they'll be able to fly away with the trap, tangle the net in thorny bushes, and escape to live another day. When the hunter comes, the quails synchronize their flight and escape, but the frustrated hunter is persistent, certain that the bird's joint effort will fail in time. And in time, the birds begin to squabble among themselves, arguing over whose wings lift more of the net, or taking offense when they stumble over each other in confusion. The quail king, who would be the future Buddha, implores the birds to stay united, but they refuse to listen. The future Buddha and the birds loyal to him fly off, and the birds who continue to bicker are caught by the hunter's net. The moral is twofold. There is strength in unity, and wisdom in knowing when to escape conflict. In another birth, the future Buddha incarnates as a golden swan. When a queen has a dream of golden swans discussing morality, she insists that her husband, the king, find such a bird and bring it to her. The king orders for a pond to be built at the foot of the mountains where the swans are said to dwell and that no one be allowed on the grounds, save a single hunter, who proclaims each day that the lake is a place of safety and tranquility. The most beautiful of the swans is their king, 
the future Buddha. While the other swans fly throughout the pond and its grounds in an effort to taste every seed, the future Buddha stands out as he's content to stay in only one place. The human king orders the hunter to spring a trap for the swan king, who is ensnared but does not cry out until his swan brethren have gathered enough food for the energy to make their return journey up the mountain. Once the others have had their fill, the future Buddha cries out in pain for them to fly away. All do save one, the king's commander, who turns back to free his liege. The swan commander flies between the hunter and the future Buddha, offering himself in the king's place. The hunter is marveled at the devotion of friendship that is far too lacking in humanity, and drops his weapon to pray. He frees the future Buddha from his trap, and the swan commander heals his liege's wounds. But rather than fly away, the swan king offers to present themselves to the human king. The king and queen are moved by the swan's devotion, as witnessing their true friendship softens their hearts and awakens their spiritual nature. They set the swans free, and set aside the pond as a true sanctuary, learning lessons in honesty, friendship, and how to walk the spiritual path. The compassion shown by the swan commander is also shown by the Buddha in another life. When he is the king of a herd of deer, living in the Banyan forests outside the holy city of Benares, now called Varanasi in northern India, the king of that city enjoys venison and instructs his servants to go into the woods and hunt a deer each day, but that the pride of his forest, the beautiful golden king and queen Banyan deer are never harmed. The deer are afraid of the hunt, and the hunter's arrows draw out their painful suffering. So they decide instead to draw lots, with one deer chosen each day to willingly go to the chopping block. One day the lot falls to a pregnant doe, and King Banyan deer, the future Buddha, offers his life in her place. The hunter does not know what to do when the king's favorite golden deer lays his own head on the chopping block. The human king asks King Banyan Deer why he would lay his life down after being promised safety. King Banyan Deer tells how he wept for the doe's unborn fawn, who would never see the warm sun or feel the cool morning dew. When the human king agrees to spare the doe, King Banyan Deer asks, What of the other deer? And when the king agrees to spare them, the future Buddha asks again, what of the other four-legged creatures? But what of the birds and the fish? In the end, King Banyandir's willingness to sacrifice himself saves all creatures from the hunt. Understanding karma as a relationship of cause and effect, we can see how one act of selfless sacrifice has consequences that spread far beyond the doe but have a profound effect on all living beings. Many Jakarta tales parallel to other stories, both from India and around the world. In some cases, the Jakarta narratives are the oldest known examples, while in others, the Jakartas are retellings of older tales. The similarities and differences can teach us much about the early Buddhist community, its philosophy, and what separates it from the world in which it developed. One tale tells of the future Buddha's incarnation as King Mandata, a legendary ancient ruler who conquered the world by his willpower. King Mandata appears in a parallel tale in the Mahabharata, the ancient Indian epic central to Hindu culture which describes the king's birth and how he's nourished by Indra, king of the gods, which gives him such power that he conquers the earth in a single day. The Mahabharata describes Mandata as a virtuous soul, possessed of great intelligence, heroic, devoted to truth, and a master of his passions. 
where the Buddhist Jataka differs from the telling in the Hindu Mahabharata is that it describes King Mandata as not being satisfied with ruling the earth. He's a capable and powerful king who makes precious jewels rain from his hands, but after thousands of years ruling the earth, he ascends to become a co-regent of heaven, splitting it with Indra. But even the joint rule of heaven is not enough for Mandata, and he rebels against King Indra, the god who nourished him in the Mahabharata's account. The Jakata tells how King Mandata, the future Buddha, falls from heaven due to his endless hunger for power and crashes to earth. In dying, he recognizes that desire can never be satisfied and that letting go is the only way forward. It seems strange to imagine the Buddha as a king driven mad by lust for power, but this story is not only noteworthy for its contrast to the earlier tradition of the Mahabharata, it also demonstrates that it is not always our actions, but rather our mindset, that matters. In one Jataka, the future Buddha is the student of a magician priest. And when they are kidnapped by thieves, the future Buddha goes to obtain a ransom. Left alone with the thieves, the priest teacher sees that the planets are aligned in just the right way for him to perform a spell. And with a wave of his hands, precious gems rain down from the sky. Just then, a second band of thieves arrive, killing the first group and demanding that the priest perform his magic again. When the priest is unable to, as the planets only align for a few brief moments each year, the bandits kill him. They then fight amongst each other for the treasure until only two survive. One surviving bandit guards the treasure, while the other goes to get food. When the food bringer returns, the guard kills him and takes the treasure and the food for himself. Not knowing that the food was poisoned, he dies shortly. When the future Buddha returns to see only riches and ruin, he recognizes what happened, and declares that those who seek selfish gain bring only ruin to themselves and others. That the tale of a treasure cursed by greed is shared by so many, from Chaucer's Pardoner's Tale to the film No Country for Old Men, is a testament to the message's truth. There are hundreds of Jacata tales, and there is absolutely no way to cover them all sufficiently in a single video. The tales of animal and human incarnations that we've looked at so far are only a glimpse. Sometimes the Buddha incarnates as a god in heaven. In other tales, he's simply a nature spirit, observing a scene as it plays out. Like the story of the wise student, it's surprising just how often the future Buddha takes a passive role. After all, if karma is a relationship of cause and effect, shouldn't it be the future Buddha's actions that determine his place in the next life? The solution to this dilemma comes when we stop looking to the Jatakas for a series of increasingly perfect lives up until enlightenment and view them instead as parts of a long process of cultivation. It is not the actions, but the effects on the mind which draw the Buddha closer to enlightenment with each story. This long process of cultivation culminates in the final ten jatakas, each of which is said to demonstrate one of the perfections associated with the enlightened. Each perfection, or paramita, a word meaning most excellent or transcendent, is reached in one of the last ten incarnations. Like the exiled prince Mahachanaka, whose odyssey home demonstrates the perfection of diligence, or the gentle prince Sama, whose perfection of loving-kindness in caring for his parents ends a family curse. The stories of perfecting virtues have had the staying power to be widely known after thousands of years. 
but none of these perfections were reached all at once. As the crown prince Temiya, the future Buddha, demonstrated the perfection of renunciation by giving up his kingdom, this comes after 80,000 years spent incarnate in a hell realm due to a greedy past life. Strangely, we might wonder if the perfect renunciation demonstrated in that tale had in fact been cultivated even in the depths of the hell which came before. And likewise, no perfection is enough on its own. The Prince Vesantara demonstrates perfect generosity by giving away his elephants, his kingdom, and even his own children. Though all ends well, it is challenging, if not indeed uncomfortable, to imagine the future Buddha allowing the possibility of harm to even those closest to him. But it is, after all, not Vesantara, Temiya, Sama, or Mahachanaka, not even the wise student or the golden swan who would be called enlightened, or Buddha, in their lives. It is the culmination of all these lives, from the selfless sacrifice of King Banyandir to the fall of the power-hungry King Mandata that led to the life of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha. The ten perfections, and indeed enlightenment itself, were not earned by actions, but attained as a result of hundreds of shifts in mindset. Whether it is a heaven, a hell, or an ordinary human life that we lead, as long as we can change our minds, we can bring ourselves one step closer to the ultimate goal. Thank you so much for joining in this look at the Jakarta Tales. Um, I went in with little knowledge about these and really was fascinated by how much I learned from these moral and spiritual elements that we covered here. Even going into history, it is also fascinating how much some of the morals differ across time and across cultures. If you read the Jakarta tales yourself, you'll notice that a lot of them are very different from some of the Mahayana stories that we've looked at, including those of the Bodhisattva Guanyin. And I am very grateful and thankful for the opportunity to be able to study these, to be able to share my own thoughts and feelings and the way that these tales affect me. I thank you very much and am very much looking forward to the next one. See you then.